My name's Christopher Gardner. All my friends know me as Topher. That's that's sort of been my nickname for the last, I guess, 18 years. <laughs> so it's kind of cool. The first half of my life, everybody called me Chris, and now everybody calls me Topher, except for my mother. My mother abhors the idea. She's like, don't take the Christ out of your name. <laughs> but um, I was a South Florida boy, grew up as sort of an urban kid in South Florida. But being urban in South Florida, we still were exposed to a lot of water, had the Everglades in my backyard and we go ocean fishing, did tons and tons of fishing as a kid. So that was sort of how I had my access to nature. I got a scholarship to go to Michigan State uh, university for field goal kicking. And I did that for four years in the mid nineties and, um, was on another peninsula. Uh, I, uh, went from the Florida peninsula to the Michigan peninsula. So once again, I was then exposed to all the different type of water sports up there and, uh, which it was totally different world, you know, that peninsula relative to the one I was from, And then after football, I ended up uh, essentially getting into yoga. Well, I actually got into yoga and massage at the latter stages of my football career to kind of heal my body. I had uh, a ton of, well, I had at least five uh, concussions from football and car accidents and things like that. And my body was pretty bent up. Cause I, as a football player, I was just a kicker. I was only, you know, about five foot nine, 195 pounds. And I had massive men crushing me <laughs> here and there. And, uh, then also I had the repetitive stress injury of hitting something as hard as I could 150 times a day, which was what field goal kicking is. And, um, so my body was extremely out of balance and, uh, I got into yoga And within a month, I didn't have to see a chiropractor again. And all this pain I started that was in my body wasn't there. And it was like a revelation. And so I was able to get off all the, uh, the pain meds that, that my college had me on. And then I got introduced to meditation, uh, transcendental meditation at first, and then uh, a type of meditation known as self-inquiry after that. Soon after, um, uh, I was out of college and that like completely shifted my life into an Eastern framework. I wanted to be, <laughs> I wanted to be enlightened. You know, I was reading Nisargadatta Maharaj and Osho and Ramana Maharshi. Like I couldn't get enough of these sages from, from India and even like you know, some of the sages that were from the far East. And, uh, I was just like, that's what life is about. Life is about, you know, attaining to the highest, uh, level of consciousness. And then the whole question of consciousness really came (laughs) to my mind. Like what is consciousness? Like if you're claiming to, to want to be, uh, I guess you would say, exalted in your level of awareness, a good question is like, what is awareness? What is sentience? And so I ended up becoming an operations director for an ashram. It was a U.S. based ashram, but we would go to India every year. And um, we did that for a couple of years and we started to get a pretty big following with people that were coming to our satsangs. And, uh, we just made a business decision actually to like, Hey, like being in South Florida with how popular we are really isn't all that smart. Uh, let's move to a destination area that wasn't in like an urban setting. And so, uh, we picked up and moved down to Costa Rica and I was about to build a 4,000 square foot ashram like meditation facility on the top of this mountain (laughs) that overlooks the ocean and uh the whole bottom dropped out of the ashram and um so i ended up finding myself with my ex-wife just kind of with our hat in our hand being like what do we do now (laughs) i can massage i can kick a ball really far i can 
teach people how to meditate and that's about it. Like I'm pretty useless. And uh, I had just been introduced to Victor Schauberger about six months prior to that. And so I just dove into everything that the natural philosophers were into. I uh, shifted my focus from Eastern thought more towards the uh, Western rationalists, the, the natural, philosoph- natural philosophers, and found like a really good balance um, because some of the works of like Walter Russell, Walter Russell um, John Morrell Keeley, uh, Steinmetz, um, I didn't read much of Tesla's own work, but I read a lot of people talking about him before he became really popularized. Uh, a lot of these natural philosophers, I was reading a lot of um, Wilhelm Reich, even though he, he didn't never termed himself a natural philosopher. He used a lot of those tenets. And then I found myself living on a biodynamic farm in the middle of the rainforest trying to learn how natural systems work and uh, taking permaculture design courses and just becoming somewhat functional in a world where uh, self-reliance is very important because up until that point, I just had very minimal construction um, experience and I wasn't a really viable man. <laughs> I couldn't really do anything uh, other than what I previously described. And so, you know, Costa Rica for, and to this day, is just this humbling, beautiful land that teaches you how to be self-reliant. At least that, that was my path. That was my per- personal astrocartography with with Costa Rica, it was always teaching me. It was like, okay, pay attention to your environment. This is the way it can be done naturally. And this is the way it can be done artificially. You choose <laughs> in this free will realm that we're in, you get to choose, but here the re- the, the results of your choices will be like instant, instant karma. <laughs> so that, that's sort of the, the, the brief description of my, my journey of 46 years on the, in this realm. Wow. Thank you for, for giving us the broad strokes. So there's a few things I want to follow back on, but let's keep on uh, Costa Rica here. You mentioned it being like the way you just described it. It sounds like it's almost like the karmic energy is faster there or the the relationship is faster right and does that have anything to do with it being on the equator being in like you know as a new englander i'm used to this sort of like cycle of cold Mm -hmm. hot cold hot and like you know stay inside then go and be outside as much as you can it seems the exact opposite there in costa rica where you know you have maybe a rainy season and a dry season, but for the most part, there's no pressure uh, of a w- incoming winter to be like, okay, we need to get this done. Uh, but there is that pressure of like the jungle growing in on you, right? And, and probably many other factors that I'm not aware of. But uh, let, us, let us know, like take us through Costa Rica a little bit. Like what, what are some of the spiritual lessons you learned there? Well, Costa Rica is a naturally unstable space. You're at nine degrees of latitude. So you're somewhat close to the equator, but you're between two of the largest bodies of water in the world. You're between the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. And the highest point of Central America was just east of me, the Chiripo mountain range. It's part of the Talamanca mountain range so that uh, you could imagine the air systems of these two oceans converging right there. So it was always a land bridge. It's a very young uh, geological formation. It's made mainly out of red clay, bauxite clay. And bauxite clay is a paramagnetic material. So up in New England, you live on a very diamagnetic bedrock. So diamagnetic is the vertical line. It's the, it's the male polarity. It's very uh, A-type. There's, there's a direction. We're going that direction. 
paramagnetic is the female energy. <laughs> it goes in every direction and it's constantly shit testing the male energy. <laughs> so a lot of people go to Costa Rica. Like I, I couldn't even tell you, there's probably a couple dozen gringos that I know that moved to Costa Rica during their first Saturn return. And if you know anything about astrology, you know, your Saturn return, which I think you're coming up on. If I, if I know you're, I just your turned birthday. 28. Yeah. Your Saturn returns usually from 28 through 29 and a half. Right. Wow. So it's a, it's a year and a half cycle, but so many people move there right before that or during it or right after that. And it's mainly, it's like a, in the area, I can only speak about the area that I was in, which was the Southern Pacific zone so that's like the rainforest you're you're not it's not like tamarindo where you're in a dry forest or anything like that this is like the jungle is on you in that paramagnetic earth where everything's constantly going in every direction and obviously the ground there is also moving all the time costa rica has about 400 earthquakes a year so that's more than one a day and they're micro, like most of them are micro, but like the first couple of years I was there, we had seven, we had seven earthquakes above a six on the Richter scale. So the land is, you know, moving and uh, you get liquefaction, you get, you just get to see the more temporal nature of, of the earth. I have recently moved to the Ozarks and this is diamagnetic. It's not quite as diamagnetic as where you are and things are more cyclical and they are more uh, structured and it is, it is a more stable environment. Like I can actually feel the stability here because literally the ground isn't shaking underneath you. Another neat thing about living in a paramagnetic area is that you're more ruled by the moon than you are by the sun. So if you're, if, if you're ever going to look at the earth as Elsie um, uh, King's model as like the cathode anode, uh, have you ever seen that model of the yeah. cathode anode? Yeah. Um, well, he has a brilliant way of looking at it. Um, the, the moon is paramagnetic. So what I would notice was I, uh, I would do these full moon hikes with my neighbor and we would hike down. I lived in front of the biggest waterfall in Central America called the Diamante waterfall. And we would hike from that waterfall and we were equidistant. Like it was a perfect triangle to two of the other largest waterfalls in all of Central America. And so we would hike from where we could look a across the valley and see the Diamante. And then we would hike all the way down on these full moon hikes. We'd leave at two o'clock in the morning. And by the time we would get down to the Nyaka waterfall, the moon would be right over the river for at least two thirds of the year. Cause you know, the, the, depending on what time of year, the moon has its, has its different uh, correlation to that angle. And so I got to really observe at night in, in the full on the difference of how the full moon felt there relative to other places and feel it with my body, feel it in relation to water. And then also I was doing tons of massage and I would listen to people because when you're a massage therapist, a lot of times you're just a therapist. <laughs> So I would listen to people a lot of times just tell me what they were going through. And I would notice all the women, how they would describe and how they would be going through things would follow the moon cycle. It was like almost like if they were all just saying the same thing, it was just moving through the community in a very, in a way that was controlled by the moon. Mm. And I was like, whoa. And I, I had I had taken a course in Celestics, which is real sky astrology, where you use a planisphere and you learn just a couple of trigonometry points. You, you essentially become like an old uh, sailboat captain <laughs> where you know how to you understand declination and inclination of the sky and the horizon. You learn the the plane ecliptic, you learn where 
where the moon and the sun are in relation to each other and all the uh, all of the now I'm, I'm losing the term all the constellations that are on that arc on that solar arc and it was just amazing to be able to be in an environment where I had enough time where I could make these observations on a, on a physical level with people relative to having direct inter interaction with my environment. Right. And I got to do that before it got commercialized for about eight years. So it, it was a, it was a real blessing to have that. So Costa Rica overall has so much water because it's in between two massive water bodies and there's these tall mountains in between these water, you have all these streams and everything like that. So you, everybody has to get in touch with their emotions there. (laughs) And in other areas that are more diamagnetic, people can repress their emotions much easier. And in, a, in an area like Costa Rica, you can, you can repress your emotions um, if, you, if you really, really try hard, but more than likely they will come out and show themselves. So it's much more in the feminine, um, I should say more, much more of the negative pole of, of how expression works in nature. It's so fascinating. And I'm curious now, maybe that's why I was so drawn to smoking cannabis as a kid, because I grew up in this diamagnetic environment where Mm -hmm. my father, his father were repressing their emotions that sociologically got passed on to me. And I was in an environment where, you know, you could just do that easier. And then you have this plant that seems to maybe grow. I'm just guessing, but maybe it grows in paramagnetic places, uh, Maybe that had something to do with it. I don't know. But wow, that's incredible. I I have always gotten this impression. I mean, I'm only 28 years old. So uh, for the most part of my life, Costa Rica was like this sort of exotic getaway. And then over the past five or six years, I started to hear about these like new age sort of cults that are in Costa Rica that are like trying to recruit people from online to to come and live there. And I'm curious as someone who's been there, you know, way before it got commercialized, like, was that a aspect that came in through like the commercialization? Like, did you experience that? Did you see that happening cult type people? And do you think that is a result of this paramagnetic energy in some way where maybe people's emotions are heightened. So they're a little bit more manipulative or, or could be led to be manipulated easier. I think it, it's actually both. Like I was led there when I was in an ashram and you know, the way consciousness worked was, was like I was making a business decision. I had been to Costa Rica and loved it and thought it was a destination area. It's like when anybody sees something beautiful, well, I won't, I won't generalize this. When I have seen things that are beautiful, I want to share them. And so because we were having workshops and people were paying to come and see us and, 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 and be a part of what we were what we were presenting in the ashram to me, it just made sense that, you know, you wanted to put that in a beautiful setting, like in a, in a much more beautiful setting than South Florida and in in an area where people actually had space, you know, there was a much lower population density. Like when we would go to India, it had its own charm. I wouldn't say it was beautiful because it's to me, it's not, it was very polluted, very, very densely populated area. And so there are certain aspects to being ex- exposed to different culture that's very beautiful. But the land, the nature in and of itself had been very abused. In Costa Rica, it still feels somewhat pristine, you know, especially when we were when we were first getting there. Like it was one of these things that was like, whoa, it's, it will open your heart just to look at a valley or, or 
be on a mountaintop and see the ocean. It's like extraordinarily beautiful. And that adds to the overall spiritual experience of knowing that you're being taken care of, like knowing that, you know, God is good type thing. And so I think we always laugh because I moved there to build, uh, for lack of a better term, a yoga and meditation retreat facility. And I've ended up building (laughs) seven different yoga and meditation retreat centers for over the years for different people. Right. (laughs) And so I find it really funny. You know, I think my, my attention was just like, I was associating it with the spiritual side of things, but what it ended up being for me in reality was business. It was like, there's only two business models down there for gringos. The first business model is, Hey, open a yoga and meditation retreat facility. (laughs) And the second business model is uh, for the, for the Costa Ricans is to open a, so what they call a soda, which is just like a small family restaurant. (laughs) There's only two business models. If you have any extra income or whatever, that's all anybody does down there. And it's just like chiropractic. Like it's the difference between a good chiropractor and a bad chiropractor. Like there's some facilities down there that are awesome. And I know people that, have really put, put their money where their mouth is and they live the life and they provide an excellent, excellent product. And then I know others, other centers where it's, it's absolute BS and there's everything in between. There's just a high density of that down there just because I think there's so much beauty. Mm. Like people know, like, you know, even if you provide a bad product, people will go there and have a great experience just because they look out their window and they see a toucan or a, or a howler monkey or something. And it's just the, the land itself is what's doing the work on you, not anything that you're providing. Mm. Yeah. And it's so a beautiful to hear you retell this because clearly you've absorbed the splendor that is Costa Rica. And it, it's such a fascinating place. I mean, especially how you describe it being in between pac- the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean. I had never thought of it that way. But when you put it in that context, it's like this uh, transitory place of two huge, huge bodies of water, this huge amount of energy, not to mention all the wind that's flowing. So, wow. I mean, Maybe it's the Saturn return, but I'm definitely getting warmed up to the idea of uh, going down there. And I think the only thing that stopped me from from traveling besides financial uh, setbacks is is just like there's this creeping pernicious propagandization of anything not America where they're like, there's guns, there's drug dealers, there's kidnappers, there's sex traffickers. It's like all these things as someone as paranoid as me, I can't not take those things into account. I'm six foot eight. I stand out. Do you think any of that's true? Is there any truth to that? Would I be in danger going to Costa Rica? I know it's, it's an entire country. It's hard to sum up uh, in just a few sentences, but like, what do you think that is? Is that just people trying to keep people in a box? Is it really dangerous? I, you know, my projection on the world is that the world is, is very friendly. Mm. I've pretty much traveled on every continent except for Australia and, and also South America. I've, I've yet to go to South America. Um, but Pretty much everywhere I've gone, even in the slums of India, you know, in some pretty hairy spots in Miami, Florida, (laughs) which is like another country, Um, you know, the slums of Detroit, of New York, like, you know, I have to say I'm a bad person to ask because I don't, I don't feel in danger. I've, I've. I felt danger. I, I I don't feel paranoid in those spaces. I've definitely been in situations with that. I knew were dangerous, probably the most being in Amsterdam. And most people think Amsterdam is like this really chill spot. And for the most part it is, but there was definitely danger happening in an alleyway where I was. Um, but overall, like the reason why Costa Rica is so popular is because it's not dangerous. 
if you're a six foot eight man and you go down there, you'll be a God. <laughs> Cause the, the Ticos are small stature people, you know, the indigenous Costa Ricans, they call themselves Ticos. And so I, I have a bunch of friends that are all ex professional athletes that live down there and they're shorter than you. And they're like the, the Ticos just like look up to, to them and just like, <laughs> You know, you can do no wrong. So at least in the area, in the Southern Pacific zone, you'd be totally cool. Well, and I appreciate that. And I have, I I tend to have the same impression uh, myself when I'm in a place that someone would consider dangerous. I mean, I live on the East Coast, New England. There's some pretty rough areas and, and I've been comfortable in them. So yeah, I gotta, I gotta let go of all those mal impressions that have been given to me by uh, people who for the most part haven't even been to those places that they have judgments about. So yeah, yeah. it's, it's a cool opportunity to, to ask you cause you have been to so many places, but, uh, but yeah, I want to go back to something you said at the beginning, uh, maybe we don't need to spend too much time on this because I do want to get into architecture and, and when that became a part of your life. But you mentioned meditation, practicing meditation, and then learning a specific technique in meditation or a type of meditation called self-inquiry. Can you expand on that? Because maybe I've done that before, but it sounds familiar and I'd like to, to learn more. Self-inquiry is known as Atma Vichara. So it's the basic, it's the basis of all Vedanta Advaita or the practice of non-duality. So in self-inquiry, what you're doing is, is you understand that you're constantly identifying with stimulus. So what you do is you redirect your outward attention towards that which is actually experiencing the stimulus. So what you would do, like for example, in this situation is when we're speaking to each other, I would, I I would internally ask, well, who is speaking to Mark? And then the internal answer is I am, I, me, I am. And you feel the I am, but you recognize by feeling the I am, there's still an observer that is observing the I am. The I am isn't in a vacuum. There's still something else that is there that is aware of that which you're identifying with. And what you're doing is, is then you're tracing where does this I am come from? And this this gets you to the fourth wall, <laughs> what I call the fourth wall. So you're in, you're in podcast production and probably other media production. So you're always producing things that people see that's in front of their eyes or they listen to, and it's in the forefront of their consciousness. The whole self-inquiry process gets you to that point where you recognize the true I am, the big I, is the fourth wall and that all experience is in front of you. Yeah, it's like that, uh, the thought observing the thought observing the thought shatters the whole thinking illusion, and then you realize who's who's actually there. <laughs> it's actually pre-thought. So my teacher, he was very big in saying that Descartes was wrong. You know, Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. Mm-hmm. And the truth of the matter is, you are before you think. Mm-hmm. So so his his he was very simple Indian man. And he was, he was very much just like you incarnate to learn how to eat correctly, sleep correctly and poop correctly. Once you learn those three things and they're much more complicated than you think, (laughs) or I should say they're not complicated because we all do them every day and it just happens involuntarily mostly but our awareness of how they're occurring and why they're occurring is very, very uh, depressed at the moment. Most of our involuntary actions that are, occur, we don't have a grade of awareness of what our conscious is, consciousness is relative to them. So he was like, once you master, master eating, pooping, and sleeping, and he was more uh, articulate than me. He didn't say pooping. He said... Uh, excreting (laughs) 
excretions because excretions can be pleasurable. That could be, you know, orgasm. That could be uh, any, anything, you, you know, let your imagination do the walking there. But his whole thing was in these moments, like, especially when you're falling asleep, what is sleep? Who is there that's aware of sleep? And most, most people don't really ever let their awareness go there. Or a better way of saying is they don't actually find that aspect of their awareness that is there during that. Because they're, they're, they are in the Descartes way of being. They're in the Descartes mind of, I think, therefore, I, I am. And that's a fallacy. The, 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 the way of looking at that is the observer and the observed r- arise at the same time. The, you can't have one without the other. Right. So when I say the fourth wall, and this is where I really think the the, the beauty of self-inquiry gets you to is you get to a state of being where there is not an observed or observer. There is just being. There is this, I guess, you know, I've likened it to, um, because it's so hard to talk about non-experience in the experiential realm. It's just like a good wipe. Like, it, it, when you cut, you can only know about it at, in, in retrospect. <laughs> you come out of it and you're just clean. Like, you don't have all your RAM is available for experience. Mm. And because you're not identified with, you don't, your identity is not misapplied you have a lot more energy and a lot more clarity in what is actually happening around you. Mm. Yeah. It, is this a sort of psychosomatic effect through yoga? Like, Because as a martial artist, I noticed the more I consciously focused on the, the body movements I was doing, the less I needed to put thought there and the more seamless my actions were. And then it sort of carried over into... Other things that I do, like, work, for instance, making art. I'm sure people who are making art are familiar with this feeling where time just sort of slips away and you're just doing, you're just being, you're being the, the process, right? Is, mm-hmm. Am I sort of describing what you're talking about? I think really you are. I really think the reason why it was so natural for me to go in that direction was because I was a high-level athlete. Mm. And so the flow state that I would get in in soccer – or in tennis or in football, all my best performances, when I would be in the flow, I wasn't doing it. There wasn't like this conscious, you know, gears grinding and me thinking about what was going on. I put in the time and the work beforehand. And then in a, in a state of high stress, there would be no stress and perfection would occur. And that was the flow state. And all my friends are people that ha- are what, w- what I would consider high performers. And they've all experienced it. Like whether they're actors or comedians or professional athletes or doctors, they all go into a very high stakes scenario. And in that high stakes scenario, there's something that occurs in, in the consciousness where the I that we normally identify with is gone. It's not there. And there's just pure experience. And even for the most part, like I've, I've, I've been, I guess you would say I, I practiced with psych, uh, psychedelics and nootropics for a good dozen years. And that is a way of like, artificially inducing that space in in some ways, depending on the setting, but in natural movement, like I think we incarnate to learn boundaries, but also we incarnate so that our body, our antenna, our, the way our, our mass moves through space is there to be perfected to a point where we can actually have these flow state moments where the, the little eye isn't there. It's just pure awareness and, f- and functional intelligence. 
And then in retrospect, you come out of it and you're like, whoa. And I used to have this discussion with all, all these ex-pro athletes. And I think that one of the reasons why a lot of athletes get depressed other than concussions <laughs> is uh, they don't have the flow state as much in their life. They like when you're practicing and you're in games and stuff like that, you're in these high stakes environments that, that it's easier to induce a flow state than when you're just kind of putzing around. And um, so what I noticed with a lot of high performers and a lot of clients of mine are that they are always putting themselves in high stakes scenarios. They're always like becoming an entrepreneur in a new field or they're trying something new. They're, they're always adding novelty to their life to simulate the stress that would be needed to actually induce the flow state. Hmm. Maybe that's why I drive fast. <laughs> hey, I, I would not doubt it, man. I, I, I really respect that. In fact, that's really synchronistic because I just got my best friend for my entire life. He loves driving fast and he's an ex, like he's a race car driver. And it, I never, even when we were kids, I never felt unsafe with him. Like we would be doing, I won't even call it dangerous because I was never in danger. To the outside perspective, it just looked like, you know, two 16-year-olds being a hooligan in, in our friend's cars. But that wasn't what it was. It was me enjoying somebody that could handle speed. Mm, and, 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 he, and enjoyed that flow state that it brought on, too. He, he went into this day. We'll go in his, in his last car. Let's just say I, I won't. I don't want to say anything <laughs> out there. Like, let's just say we're going 100 plus miles per hour where we shouldn't be going 100 plus miles per hour. And I felt relaxed because this guy at speed is a master. Yeah, man. That's brilliant. And to your point that you're making, it's bringing up the thought that we don't have enough ceremony we don't have enough dance in our in our society anymore and that's why you saw things like sports and dance ritualized and ceremonialized uh, at least in the ancient world and still today in some indigenous cultures because it's a natural part of our human lifestyle i mean uh, to get out and move your body you know that's why ecstatic dancing is still a part of many different religions uh, usually secretly but yeah they do all sorts of uh, dances to get yourself into this you know heightened state of awareness and maybe even receive some some uh, insight from god or whoever you know whoever you're you're dancing for <laughs> oh man i'm i'm a huge huge a uh, fan of cymatics and vibratory healing. I've done, I've been, I've been in a lot of ceremony, even like, even as a little kid, just this is like the crappiest example, but it, it was very pertinent. I had, my dad had awesome stereo systems growing up and, you know, he would listen to what I would consider like good rock and roll music growing up. And he, uh, for his thesis in architecture school was he built a, a hyperboloid. So it's like the inside of an hourglass and he did it with strings. And at the top, it was hooked to a woofer, like a big, no, at the bottom was a big woofer, like a 12 inch woofer. And at the top, I think he had four drivers, like four mid ranges and he hooked them up. And they were all different color strings. And when the string would vibrate at a certain note, it would flash a certain color light. And that's, that's, that was his graduating thesis, you know, uh, build at Florida State University. And so he was into sound. But I didn't, I never grew up in a musical, like we didn't, we weren't a musical family in the sense like we played any instruments. So we would go to Epcot for vacation and we were at the Japanese temple space at Epcot and they start doing the big drums. And I was six years old and I lost my mind. I was just like, I could not stop moving. I was just like, ah! I might've been eight years old. 
I was, I was either, I was in that age range and I was just like, it was one of those cymatic moments where I had no control over my body. My body was being moved. And I say that to this day, I was like, I don't dance. I get danced. And then, um, Emily Moyer, do you know her from Strange Mosaic? Absolutely, yeah. She's a good friend of uh, my friend Mike Wan. So, yes, oh, friend of a friend. Ex- excellent. Well, she and I really connect on this because we're, we're the same age, and we both came up during the rave, like the original rave days. And I would go to these raves, and I was on no drugs because I was an athlete. Like I was getting drug tested like every few weeks. So I, w- and I was so naive to the fact that everyone was on ecstasy. <laughs> I had no idea because that wasn't in my purview. So I would go to these raves and everybody would be moving the same way. And just like, it was like a huge, like video from th- like, like, you know, back in the eighties, like when everybody would dance and lockstep with each other and stuff like that. But you, I would go to these raves and everybody would like the DJ would like do the build and we would all just like be doing it and we'd get in it. And before you know it, there'd be like three, 4,000 people just moving. It was like a school of fish. It was amazingly beautiful experience. And because I, I, I wasn't inebriated in any way, my heart would open. My heart would just go. And maybe, and I'm also very, I, I get into sympathetic resonance with people and I know people on ecstasy, their heart opens. So maybe that was part of it. But to this day, cymatics and vibrational uh, healing arts, even we, um, we initiated one of the last temples that I built. The woman brought this huge crystal bowl and she was having, she was singing the crystal bowl and they put river water from the local river in the bowl. And it was amazing. There was like at least 15 or 16 of us that were watching. She was doing the, the crystal bowl and the cymatic pattern of the water. Like it froze, like it created this crystalline, you know, shape in the water. And that temple is absolutely stunning. I really, I really think, her doing that little invocation set the tone for the building pad for everything that we did from that point. Cause it was a difficult build. Like it was not an easy thing to do, but we knocked it out of the park. And so I'm, I love everything to do with vibration, vib- vibrational physics. I'm a, I'm a huge uh, studier of it's called sympathetic vibratory physics. Uh, from Dale Pond. He's a contemporary of uh, John Wel- John Warrell Keeley. And yeah, learning about harmonics and how harmonics work on water. I, I'm I'm all about it. He his name is Dale Pond. Yeah. It's interesting that both of the words in his name are references to bodies of water, a dale and a pond. But <laughs> what when you mentioned uh Warrell Keeley earlier my ears perked up because I have this book over here. Um, let's read it. It's right next to me. Hold on. Where did it go? Oh. Free Energy Pioneer, John Worrell Keeley. I found this book at a used bookstore, and I was stunned. It's by Theo Pymans, who's uh, apparently sort of a, a cult scholar over there in the Netherlands. But... Um, Tell us about this guy, because I'd never heard of him until I found that book, and apparently he was uh, he was uh, alive prior to Tesla and was doing all of these free energy experiments in Philadelphia, is it? I mean, mm-hmm. that's incredible. Yeah, he wasn't just doing experiments. Like, he was hired by... Uh, uh, he, he could dig tunnels, let's say, more efficiently than anyone else could at the time using vibration and so he was highly sought after by railroad companies so a lot of the the tunnels the way that they're dug are not are not the way we were told that they were dug so he figured out 
the harmonics for association and disassociation of all different materials. He was very much in the same uh, ray of energy that um, uh, Walter Russell was. So the way they looked at the world is, is that they looked at it more from an ether perspective than they did from an atomist perspective. An ether um, essentially being an absolutely solid medium. It's just very subtle relative to our mass. And th they worked on how the harmonics within this, within our four four dimensional space could either induce extra energy from the ether or uh, extract energy from this for four dimensional space and pull it into the ether. A uh, in a more modern parlance, it's, it's, it's the scale. It would be essentially they were describing the scalar domain. And I love the scalar domain because the scalar domain, I, I get a lot of, um, I understand how it works through the feminine component of experience. So the best way of saying that, like scalar is the ambiance. So like if you have a sensitive heterosexual woman and you have a certain intention, the ambiance has to match that intention. If if the ambiance that you're providing doesn't match your intention, she'll, she'll shit test you. She'll literally be, she'll re, she'll reject you relative to your intent. So there's this, it's like, um, if you've ever had really fine stemware with drinking either like a very nice uh, glass of whiskey or a very nice champagne, the stemware or the rocks glass that you use has a lot to do with the actual flavor of what you experience. The container delivers the experience. And that's what scalar physics is. I, I'm really like making, I'm trying to make it as simple as possible, but that's what scalar physics is. Scalar physics is, or ether physics is, I can engineer the container to create the outcome that I want. Right. And the container in this, in this regard is invisible to, to our, our uh, natural senses. Right. When you start to take some of the psychedelics, your frequency range um, opens up more. And so you have more, you can peer more into the scalar domain. Now, when we're talking about the difference between a paramagnetic and a diamagnetic environment, would scalar waves play into that at all? Would there be maybe a higher amount of magnetism in the you know field in certain places? Does that affect the, the scalar domain of that area as well? Yeah, life is specific. Life is extremely specific. So how each one of us like we have different, have you ever heard the term astrocartography? Well, you mentioned it earlier and I made a note of it. So I'm glad we're here. Uh, I would like you to elaborate on that. So depending on where you are in the realm, your, your uh, I guess your template, like I call it your celestic profile. Other people call it your natal chart. The template of how you were, how you were engineered before your free will came online will interact differently with every environment. And that's your astrocartography. Right. So how you how you express in the northeast of the United States is going to be very different than how you're going to express in let's say Slovakia, because it's a different base. Like you could say, the land that you are is the base harmonic, is the base frequency. Then your frequency overlays that, and that creates a different harmonic than where you were born or where you live now. Were you born where you live right now? Mm -hmm. So this is one of the things that I've, I've started studying with the law is where a person has the most power 
from like standing up for their own rights and standing up is a very specific term is in the county that they're born. <laughs> and I think there's this thing where like, you know, I'm making a jump, I'm making a logical leap here, but there is wherever you were born um, at least in the past, that's probably where your placenta was buried. You know, your, your twin of yourself was buried in that ka of the, of the Kabbalah, that life force energy that came with you into this land is now part of the earth. And that carries a resonant pattern. When you move, when you go to a different area, you're going to have a different resonant pattern and it will express different aspects of your chart. So like in astrocartography, they'll say, hey, if you move here, this is m much more of what's going to be expressed than if you move here, then this is what's going to be expressed. And there's a ton of truth to it because that's actually a tenant in ether physics and also Raja yoga is frequency is location. So your, your location there in new England, that is your frequency. If you were to move to Costa Rica, the frequency there is a different location. It's a different frequency. And then you get to experience that different aspect of yourself. Like for example, for me, living in South Florida, Michigan, in every area that I've ever lived in, I've expressed completely differently. Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, really haven't traveled that much, but I did feel I did feel a different side of myself when I was in Colorado. I spent a few weeks there, really not enough time to to make a a major assessment, but yeah, that's the only place I've ever spent a considerable amount of time uh, outside of New England, for, and it's yeah, it seems like it seems like the part of my life where I began to be more self-sufficient. Uh, I started wrapping crystals and making these like necklaces that I then sort of sold. I can't pull one; they're all attached. Oh, here we go. I want to show you. Um, but I started making these, and this kind of led into what I'm doing now in a way because i that's when I came up with the name Mystic Mark, and now I sometimes call myself Mystic Mark here on the podcast. But, yeah, I started making all these crystal wraps when I was in Colorado because I, need, awesome. I needed money to get out of, <laughs> get home, and, and uh, that's all I had on me were some of my crystals and some wire, and, and I just put it together and started selling uh selling them at these shops in colorado and it's funny i i don't know what that is technically on the astro cartography charts i'd have to go in and ask somebody about the energy there but uh but yeah that's really cool yeah colorado you know being on the eastern slope or if you were in like the denver area I was, i'm yeah. not gonna assume mm -hmm. like if you're on the eastern slopes of of the rockies you know, that's called the Rockies. <laughs> so your consciousness, you know, went to rocks, went to coherent rocks. It went to crystals, which are coherent geological formations. And so you were, your frequency literally changed. You start making this beautiful art and that art filled in what you needed for your intention to be completed, which was to get back to New England. Mm. And now you've incorporated that into your, into your being. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it was like a business, the same way you described, like going to Costa Rica kind of brought out the business mindset for you. Like I was making them prior to that, but it wasn't until I got to Colorado that I had a reason to sell them. And I was like, how do I sell these? I got to like market them correctly. I went and bought like index cards and wrote down what they all were. But yeah, you're absolutely right. It was like a, it was like, uh, you know, something about the Rockies, but <laughs> <laughs> we have a, we have a crystal, we have four crystal bowls here. My girlfriend is very, uh, adept at playing them and it's a, it's a definitely a welcome sound to hear in the apartment. It's nice and calm, but you mentioned putting river water inside of the crystal bowl and seeing the cymatic pattern. Mm-hmm. 
is this something that you integrate into your profession, like using uh, these sort of water structured water or, or the process of, of changing the structure of water? Like what? Yes. Let's get into that. I want to know, like, cause for people who don't know, we talked about your, your, your sort of um, history and, and what you did in school, but you were going to school for architecture. I don't think you mentioned that. No, no you weren't, no. but your father, no, I, your father did. My dad did. Okay. Yeah. So when did you get interested in architecture? Well, I was always interested in engineering from a young, from when I was a little kid, just because my dad was an architect and he built skyscrapers. So I got to go to lots of testing for hurricane proof materials because on these buildings that are, you know, stand 25 to 30 stories tall in South Florida, they have to have like windows and siding and all these things that can handle Um, at least in the eighties and nineties, they had like, they had to have ratings of uh, 125 plus miles per hour winds, like sustained winds. So one of my most fun memories as a little boy was my dad taking me to them testing these windows that they were putting up at the time on the large, in the tallest building in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, on one of his jobs. And they shot this two by four at 125 miles per hour at a piece of glass. And I got to watch the glass just wobble, like, like, you know, the first matrix where they, you see the glass ripple. And I got to see that in real life. And uh, so I was just amazed. And I was always amazed with what my dad could do just with like a block and tackle. Like my dad built the whole like extra extension to our house. I grew up in just him in a block and tackle. So he was lifting huge beams and he showed me as a little boy, like the, the force multiplier of a pulley system. And I got into remote control cars, like when I was about 10 years old and, uh, I fell in love with everything electronic. So I got, my grandfather got me a remote control car, a remote control I had remote two, I had four remote control cars, dirt cars, road cars. And then I got, um, a remote control boat. Like I was, I was Mr. RC, like to the point where my dad told me you're either going to do the RC stuff or you're going to do sports. You have to choose. Cause you're, you're way, you're, you're way too much <laughs> on this side. Right. And so, um, I really, I, I had the engineering propensity. Like I love ripping everything down and then building it back up. And my dad made sure I had like a nice tool bench and I had good tools and he showed me like how to solder things correctly. And then, um, getting into high school, hurricane Andrew hit South Florida. And when hurricane Andrew hit it, 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 it was the first, my first taste of disaster capitalism because the whole area in construction was kind of depressed and the hurricane hit and it was this massive construction boom. And for like a couple of years, they had all these things coming on the news about hurricanes and stuff like that. And one was this, um, it was an awesome thing that 60 Minutes did on this, this guy who built this dome and how his dome home in North Carolina survived this massive hurricane. And my dad and I were just like amazed by this huge dome structure. And then I would go to Epcot, like I told you as a little boy, and they had the big sphere. So they did the buckyball, but they did like the full buckyball. You know, they call most geodesic domes buckyballs or a bucky hemisphere. Mm. And here the Epcot dome, the Epcot ball was a full buckyball and it was known as a nine frequency buckyball. So I always had like domes in the back of my mind and hurricanes and how to survive storms and had a little bit of uh, some mechanical know-how, but then also being an athlete, like a lot of, a lot of times being an athlete, it's about your proprioception. It's about your awareness of your body in space. And so that really helped me in kind of just 
being aware of like what physically feels right and what physically doesn't feel right. And then the big push that brought me fully into architecture was losing all my money in Costa Rica. And I was like, what can I build with the money that I have? (laughs) And I looked at all these different building styles relative to what I saw fail there. And I was like, domes are the way to go. Like domes by far handle hurricanes and, and tornadoes and earthquakes better than any other structure. And then I love the principle behind all these curved structures because there's a principle in nature called uh, conservation of surface area. Like in nature, the reason why everything is curved is because it's extremely energy intensive to make something flat and straight. Like it's totally not environmentally friendly (laughs) to try and make something flat and straight. It's not strong and it's extremely energy intensive to do it. And that's why I'm I'm looking out my window now and there's nothing in the natural world that is flat and straight. So, and I don't want to go off on a tangent because I feel like I'm interrupting, but what, what's the fascination with these cubes then? Because that's all, like 90% of architecture is like cube and square based, right? It's, uh, my dad actually told me, my dad was a Bauhaus, arch- he was trained in the Bauhaus School of Architecture at Florida State University. And it was all for population control. Mm. Like it, 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 he, when he was in architecture school, they made you design all the furniture that was in every room of every, you know, let's say uh, structure that you were going to build. So it was like, you're thinking fully throughout the building and it was a way to uniform. It was to make everything uniform so that you could have one person controlling it at the top. Where in the past, we had these guilds of master craftsmen that had artistic leeway and that you would go into a space and look at the the terrain and you would build to fit the terrain. You wouldn't build to dominate the terrain. And the Bauhaus method was, it was instituted to actually dominate the 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 rationale of man to make it submissive and it worked like all the condos my dad abhorred living on the east coast of of florida at the east coast of broward county because all he saw were what he saw in college which was these condominiums where everybody was stuck in a in a cube right and he would do whatever he could to live out in the western part of the county where you could build your own structure, you could live on a little land, you could kind of spread your legs, you weren't like, you know, fully up on somebody else's crawl all the time. And um, he, like, he, w- he went to college in the 60s, you know, like this was something that had been well, well planned and well instituted. So we live in cubes by design. Um, there from, from a manufacturing, from a post world war II perspective, if you want to maximize profit, you get rid of master, master craftsmen. You, you have everything from a top down perspective. You essentially build modular things and you sell those modular things through salesmen and who, who cares how it interacts with the environment? That's not your problem. Your problem is just to give people volume to live in. Yeah. Well, what about domes make them so resistant to hurricanes? And don't you think there'd be like maybe a little incentive or is it because of disaster capitalism where they're like, who cares if it gets destroyed? It's worth more for us to go in and rebuild it. Well, you know, the U.S. was built on disaster capitalism, whether it was war-induced disaster or natural disaster. Like everything, I shouldn't say everything, the majority of the the financial drivers in the money-making world are all based on disaster capitalism. It's not profitable to make something that is engineered for the environment because if it is engineered for the environment, it will last longer. 
it, it, it will need less repairs, less maintenance. And in all honesty, they're much simpler to build. So like I'm designing domes right now for my first clients in the United States. And when I show them the geometry, initially they get like a little bit like overwhelmed by the geometry. Like, I think I've sent you some pictures on, on telegram of, of like just the base geometries of these domes. But once you understand the basis of it, it's so easy. Like I got into it because it's, it's, uh, it's under Schauberger's axiom. It's a uh, nature is simple efficient and easy. She really is. She doesn't waste. She, she, there's an economy with everything that she shows us. And uh, what happened to the hyper male diamagnetic, we're going to conquer ah, the empire. Everything got very right angly vertices, like just everything became like this. Essentially, uh, uh, they, they say architecture is frozen music. <laughs> the, the music that got frozen from an empire perspective would be like very, very loud rock and roll music. Or like that key that they play in horror movies. Ding, 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 you know, that noise. That's what I think of when I see like, uh, I don't know if you've been to Connecticut, but in Connecticut we have uh, right along I, where I-95 and I-91 meet. So everybody drives through, sees it. This huge, huge, like, uh, I think it was the Goodyear Tire Factory back in the day. And they designed it in this architectural style called brutalism, where Oof. things are particularly made the way you described, like, with that intention of, like, this is going to dominate the landscape, uh, you know, bleak, very, like, solid and like mute colors and almost like built in a way that it imposes itself on the people who go in and out of the building like it's meant to make you feel small so to speak right and yeah. uh it's a, it's a really interesting building because it's shaped from one side like an i and then the other side like an h or or like a o with like a center like it's literally like hell like the second uh i guess like the fourth fifth sixth and seventh floors are all suspended away from the first second and third floor and then the four, where the fourth floor would be it's just two beams holding up the the fifth sixth seventh and eighth so it's a strange looking building and they recently turned it into a hotel but it's my understanding that brutalism is like that what you describe is it boss house or ball house Mm -hmm. Ball house. mixed with communism right like the communists <laughs> took that and they were like all right let's let's get it, go and take it up a notch <laughs> yeah so it's kind of cool for me because i was looking into how could i build for myself in an affordable way and i read this book from uh called the i think it was like the guide to earth bag building and it had this iranian gentleman who had who had figured out this super adobe system and he was a he was a skyscraper builder like my dad that after in 1981 i guess there was a huge uh, earthquake in tehran iran like the capital of tehran and he watched a lot of these massive buildings that his construction firm was a part of fall to the ground and what he saw the only thing that was left in the wake of this massive earthquake were all these beehive uh, kilns that the, that either pot, pottery people were using, potters were using, or bread bakers. And he goes, why am I wasting my time building these massive erections of steel and, and, and glass when simple clay, if you shape it the right way, can survive you know, a massive earthquake? And so he devised the system of super adobe and the second I read that book, I was hooked. And because I, all I saw in Costa Rica was an abundance of clay. <laughs> the red clay is everywhere. And I was just like, well, if I have land and I have no money, I have time. I have no money. I can learn the skill and I have the material. And so I started drawing all the different types of, of uh, house layouts that I wanted and then one of my massage clients saw 
one of my designs. And he's like, that's the exact house that I've been dreaming about. And I said to him, I was like, well, if you send me to school to learn how to do it, I'll build it for you. And he did. He sent me to Cal Earth and I, I was in one of the last classes of uh, Ileona Kalili, who was Nadir Kalili's wife, the guy that I'd been reading all about with the Super Adobe. And uh, yeah, they were amazed because I went there and I took the practice, I, I took the extra time and and they were like, so wh- why are you learning this? And I was like, well, I'm, I'm actually going to build this structure that you see right here. And they were like, what are you talking about? You're going to build it. And I'm like, I came here to learn the system to actually implement it. Like I'm going to build it. And then I was surprised. I'm like, what do you mean? What do, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, and they're like, well, most people, they're like maybe one in a hundred people that come to our workshops actually do anything with it. Really? Uh, I go, no, I'm literally going back to build this thing. Yeah. And it was like super advanced. It had like two story domes with massive, massive deck. And uh, we built it. We built that in, in April. We started construction in April of 2008 and we were done by September of 2008. And that was my first, like that was probably my biggest dome project Uh, that I've ever done. We moved over a hundred meters of material and compacted that into three domes. (laughs) And uh, that house isn't going anywhere. I'll tell you that. I mean, and the the entire structure is made of, uh, of clay of this adobo. It's uh, so Adobe technically is clay and sand mixed where you bake it, where they call it super Adobe. The technical name of Super Adobe is flexible form rammed earth construction. Mm-hmm. So you can make Adobe by cooking it or you can make Adobe by ramming it. And so we take these long bags. Like you never see those like uh, polyethylene sacks that people put agricultural products in. Mm-hmm. And they usually cut them so they're like this big, this big or whatever. Well, you can buy the roll that makes those bags mm. and use that roll as a form. And so, um, whatever the shape is of my wall, I'll just lay, I'll lay markers down where we're going to lay the bag. We backfill the bag and then we compact it. And so I can have an above ground footer system, which is very, very, uh, resilient to earthquakes. Cause usually what happens in a, in a conventional building, whatever you have at, at ground height and in the ground is working against your roof. So if you have shear, which is the buildings moving laterally like this, the roof and the floor go in opposite directions. Right. It's like a counterbalance. It's like when you're, when you're kicking, like as a martial artist, right? If you're throwing a front right kick, you're, you're actually sending part of your weight back to, so that you can extend through your kick. Right. Mm -hmm. Everything is the same in nature. So if something is being pushed, the top is being pushed one way, which is what wind will do, the ass of it will kick out in the direction that it's being pushed from. Mm. And this is called shear strength. And that's why domes are so resilient because what they figured out with domes, and this is why nature uses domes with everything, is that if you have shear, the whole thing moves as one which is what the term monolithic comes from. It moves as one piece. You don't get the parallelogram effect that you get with masonry or post and beam construction. Right. Yeah. And that's why when we have these great reset earthquake situations, everything's just left as rubble. And uh, yeah, it it makes you wonder like maybe they uh, plan for this kind of thing because they know it's worth more for them to go in and rebuild it than it is to have something that lasts for thousands of years. If they're thinking from this uh, profit first mindset that seems to at least be uh, a part of this country I'm in. Are you still are you in the States right now? Are you down in the in another country? What's your your location? I oh, you said in, you're in the Ozarks. You told me uh, that. Yeah. Right on. Okay. Yeah, cool. yeah. Next week we're moving to Missouri. Oh, so, cool. yeah, we we bought a farm in Missouri, and it's it's 
it's like the perfect permaculture farm. It has lots of water. It's near water. So I'm super stoked. Mm. We've been living in this, in this spot for about a year now, but the farm that we initially bought, it did, it doesn't have enough water. So everything I've learned from a permaculture perspective, I've, I've been jonesing for a farm that has its own springs and is near other big bodies of water. Cause mm. you know, I, I, I really believe water is extremely important yeah. <laughs> for, for everything. Yeah. We, but I, I wanted, I wanted to give you a little insight that you probably already know is all these massive structures, like just for example, like the pyramids that we know of and uh, say some of these cathedrals, they all use these principles where you can still have straight lines. Like you can still build something, you know, a vertical element, but like in, in the case in point of a cathedral, they have these things called buttresses and flying buttresses. And so if, if you see the way they frame all these buildings that look very straight from the outside, the internal aspect of them have all these arches, even like the Colosseum from Rome, you know, you have this circular Colosseum and it has all these arched openings all over the place. And like the next, my, my dream home that I'm going to build for us is like, I, I've, you not only do you save on material, but every time you create an arch form, you create an incredible uh, dissipation of, of, of vertical forces. And so you can really kind of, uh, you can take a more conventional structure and just really, when I say conventional, a more rectilinear structure, and you can really firm it up by adding arches and vaults and certain things like that in certain areas. And then the the building will be much more resilient. Mm. Yeah. Now, when you say a flying buttress, is there... um can you help me visualize that? Cause I see it in my mind, but I'm not sure if I'm thinking of the right one. Is this the, the horizontal beam that kind of is in between the, the, like the sh- the shafts that go up to make the arch. Is that like, kind of like the base uh, that holds them in the middle? No, the flying buttress would be like, so if you have the, the vertical, let's just say uh, the cube that's elongated, making a spire. Mm-hmm. And then you have these triangles off the side that go like this. And then you see arches, arch forms Mm -hmm. that actually keep that vertical area that has all the mass from moving laterally. Got you. So you have the, you actually have the triangular form that is stopping whatever forces are trying to make that, that box move like this. It stops it from doing that. And then if it does move, it dissipates its music. Once again, it'll go from one arch to two arches to three arches to four arches. And it will dissipate that, that shock wave, that, that musical note down to the ground to where it dissipates to where it won't affect the main structure. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's, it certainly feels that way when you're in a cathedral that the whole building is a musical instrument but when you put it in these terms it's it's not even a matter of of words it's the truth it's a it's an instrument now when it comes to this uh well at least what's been really fascinating me lately is that these stone structures here in new england uh some of them stone chambers they're built with corbelled or corbelled, I think is the term, mm-hmm. ceilings that work in the same way as an arch, right. so that the you know weight is dissipated. And some of these structures, the theories go from well, the natives built them to the colonists built them to oh no, some Europeans who are here a really long time ago built them. But what's really fascinating, and I'm wondering what you think about this, is they've they've determined that they're not ice cellars, which is the colonial explanation because the sun comes through a certain portion of this during the winter time when you would think that, you know, you would, you wouldn't want things to be melting in there. Um, 
But it's interesting because you mentioned the tilt. The sun sort of tilts, it goes, and the moon does the same thing. And these stone chambers are usually aligned to receive the sun during the winter when you would want to warm the structure mm -hmm. up because it's colder out. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's still undetermined whether or not they were actually uh, living in there. It doesn't seem like people were living in there. It seems like they were more of like... A, transformative mental plate like places to go to meditate or to uh even keep track of certain you know time like a calendar you see the sun come through you know okay it's this time of the year but uh, have you looked into that at all these sort of megalithic stone structures it seems like you have what, what have you learned i've been fascinated with this forever <laughs> so i'm i'm very lucky i went to um probably the only public school for geopolymers in the world. It's called the geopolymer Institute in uh, San Michel, France. So in Northern France, uh, about an hour away from the, the Belgian border, Joseph Davidovitz, Dr. Joseph Davidovitz figured out in the seventies um, that the majority of the rock, like quote unquote rock, that are in a lot of these megalithic structures and pyramids were actually created. They were man-made and it, and it's no longer a mystery. Like I'm not saying this, like this is something it's only a mystery to the, to the uninitiated, let's say <laughs> like, this is something that's being used. Militaries around the world are using this very, very rich people are using this to build their structures and their bunkers. So a, a geopolymer is essentially a man-made stone. So what he had figured out was in, in, in Egypt and the, um, where the, in Cairo, like where the, where the uh, Giza plateau is, excuse me, he went and studied samples of the rock there and he was a, in, in the, the, what remained of some of the casing stones that were there. And then the base stones of the, of the great pyramid. And he was like, Oh, this is, this is a polymer. This is the, they, what they did was they created a cement that wasn't uh, an alkaline cement. They created a binder that was actually an acidic binder. And he was, <laughs> he was, he was ousted from, from Egypt by the late seventies because he was like, he pretty much showed the, that everything that they were pushing about the slave narrative to build the, the pyramids was absolutely false. It was actually, and now, now that they've unearthed more of the Giza plateau, they see that it was actually like this incredible artisanian village of, of master, master uh, mason workers. But what they were doing was, was that they would farm the calcium components from the Nile river, from all the crustaceans in the Nile. Then there was a massive, massive, cal uh, I believe it was bentonite clay, which is a more calcium rich clay deposits just north of Giza. And then the Sahara Desert at the time that these things were being built was actually a forest. It was the world's largest forest. And so they would cut the trees down and burn the trees to make fly ash. And then they would mix the fly ash with a material known as natron. And the natron with the fly ash, with the sand from the Nile River, with the, with the calcium that they were getting from the crustaceans, and then from the, uh, then the, the calcium bentonite clay, when you combine all this in the right ratios, it hardens into limestone. Wow, and limestone is this like fantastic material. It it it's antimicrobial. Most of human civilizations are built around it, right? I mean, it's yeah. it's incredible. Wow. So, and there was always this mystery around. It wasn't only just in in Egypt or in North Africa where they were finding pyramids. You know, there's pyramids pretty much on every continent. Right. And it wasn't until he saw 
these pyramids down in South America, I believe in Peru, forever archaeologists were trying to figure out what this indention on the right side of all these stones, I forget what pyramid it was. And, you know, for years and years and years, they're mulling over what's, what does this indention mean? Why would the people that, that carve these rocks out of the earth and then move these huge limestones, why would they make these indentions on all the limestones? And he's like, no, you idiots. That's what happens when you, when you put a brace against a form board and you have something solidifying. And I've poured thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds of concrete. And I know this to be true. You put form boards up, you have to put pressure on the outside of the form board to handle the weight of, of the, of the slurry that you're putting in. And so the second I heard him say this and make that connection, I was like, holy shit, this guy's got it. All they were doing was they would pour one block and everybody would be coming up with their, you know, their sack of sand, their sack of calcium, uh, calcium carbonate, their sack of uh, calcium bentonite clay, their natron, and they would throw it. They would mix it in place in a form. It would set. And here's the kicker of it. And this is the coolest thing was you talked to a lot of people that theorize that the outside of the pyramids had dark casing stones and the dark casing stones would attract heat. They would pull heat in. Well, if you heat a geopolymer, it cures like 10 times as fast. So I bet you they, as they were building it, they just kept, they would, they would mix in a darker pigment into the outer casing stones as they were going up and they would let the sun bake it in place. <laughs> yeah. And they're in so, it. So the whole like, you know, ancient aliens thing or like, you know, all the different things of like, you know, priests levitating limestone from quarries that have never been found. They've, they found quarries in areas near there, but nowhere near the amount of volume of limestone that was taken out of the ground even comes close to what is above the ground. Yeah. And he figured this whole system out. And then he was able to show that the Romans used a derivation of that with their aqueduct system and a lot of their buildings. And what was so cool about it was the, the geo, you can make a geopolymer to kind of match the pH of the environment that it's in. So when you do that, like let's say you're making a cement, like a geopolymer that's going in water. If you know the relative pH of that water and you make your slurry the same way, the water won't erode it. The wow. water won't oxidize it. Wow. So yeah. would we would we assume then that maybe the environment of Egypt has changed over the vast amount of time that it's been there? Because they do talk about the erosion on certain structures like the Sphinx mm -hmm. uh, showing possibly like flooding in that area. Uh, would that be maybe uh, like knowing what you just described yeah. maybe could help us understand more about the Sphinx in an accurate way uh, rather than, you know, assuming that it's, it's, it's been built without that pH in mind. Well, the Sphinx is funny. Cause I think that's why he got kicked out of Egypt. Mm. They were showing like, they're like, look, there's all these seashells in the side of the rock. So that shows that like 12,000 years ago during the deluge that this area was flooded to this height. And he's like, no, you dipshit. The whole reason why there's all these embedded crustaceans in them is because they use the crustacean shells in their mix. Wow. And I, I know this to be true because in South Florida, all of our roads have seashells in them. Mm. You'll go up to something solid. You'll go up to a concrete road. And there's quadrillions of broken up seashells in them. Really? So the second, yeah, because it's calcium. All right. a seashell is, is calcium. Right. My new company in the States is called Coral Domes. I'm building aircrete domes. And the whole thing is, it's all, all by weight. If, if you're just to be like a, a, a chemist about it, by weight, cement is mostly calcium. And that's what coral is. It's mostly calcium. It's a binder. Mm. 
And so given the right solution, that will bind anything that you connect to it. Right. So that's the way our bones are built. Now, I want to go back to New England because what you're saying about the, the megaliths is fascinating, and I wouldn't be surprised if some of those techniques were integrated up here. Uh, but in particular, maybe you've seen these. Uh, there are several standing stones, which are glacial erratics is what geologists call them. Huge stones that are just happen to be resting upon three smaller stones. You know, we're talking a 30 ton boulder and it's just precariously resting on one, two, three, maybe 400 pound stones. Right. And, and what happens is scientists have found that there's a piezoelectric effect going on, uh, where maybe these natives would have been aware of that and they would have put their seeds underneath this giant boulder and the piezoelectric energy would have, you know, made the seeds uh, more abundant when they went to crop. Absolutely. What was the name of the the vaulted space that you're bringing up earlier that was mm. underneath the cathedral spaces? What was that called again? That you said the sun would shoot into? Oh, the stone chambers. Yeah, in New England. There's a bunch What's of stone chambers. What's the name chambers. of those chambers, though? Uh, I, you, used a, you used a very specific term. Huh. I don't remember. Oh, corbled. The corbled. corbled. Yeah. Okay. So corbelled piezoelectric and these things that you're talking about, these like essentially these huge rune stones that are, that are, you know, propped up, that's all for piezoelectricity. So, so what you do, like we started our conversation talking about scalar physics or ether physics, where you engineer the environment to give you the, the actual product of what you want. Okay. So these corbelled roofs are amazing. The geometry, cause I build vaults. I'm a profession, professional vault builder. So there are a vault on four axes that connect to these, these I'm calling them geopolymer rods or posts that connect to another layer of masonry it's usually over some sort of internal body of water. Most of these buildings have sunken cisterns or they're over channeled water. And so what these what they are essentially doing was was making a very advanced geopolymer piezoelectric generator. Because a lot of these buildings, especially if we're talking about cathedrals that have the corbels or what they call bathhouses, they all had a musical instrumentation that was up high. So that would vibrate and saturate the building and then the whole building would vibrate. The whole building would take on a vibratory pattern and that vibratory pattern, because of the shape of the building, could be transduced into intention like let's say it was like the you know december 21st solstice and the light was the lowest on the horizon and it was coming in you could really get a lot of work done through the subtle subtle energy fields with these types of structures and they 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 knew the sky much better than we do now you know they didn't have as much false light as we do and a lot of their entertainment was actually like looking up looking up at the sky and knowing their interaction with the seasons and knowing their interaction with their environment and depending on it and having reverence for it. And so I don't believe for one second that there were glaciers that moved a massive 30 ton rock on top of three smaller rocks. I I'm with you and I'd love to show you uh, some photos Tara and I, we discovered a glacial erratic yesterday, uh, and I've never seen this in any of the books we've bought. Uh, no one's talked about this. It's not in, like, native legends, uh, but we found this crazy-looking stone uh, on top of another stone. And you mentioned before that, you know, you didn't think that maybe uh, they were levitating these, but w what would your speculation be on how they came to to get those in that place do you think they were levitating them in certain cases and and not in a, like egypt for example 
Um, because that's that's at least what the folklore says, right? That the shaman uh, meditated and lifted this stone and put it in place. You think there's a more uh, material explanation or, or logical explanation for it? There's a lot of different explanations. So have you ever heard of uh, Ed Leedscallen who built the Coral Castle down mm-hmm. in Miami? Yeah. So that was down in my neck of the woods. And he was using for lack of a better term, an electrogravitic effect where he was essentially, he was creating a vibration a lot like Keeley would. And then he would create a harmonic that when that harmonic interacted, you have to be somewhat of a material scientist would interact with these big slabs of coral. He knew the harmonic that was necessary to essentially cancel from our perspective, the mass or the weight of it. And so there were all like, I mean, legends of him just being able to move a rock just with, with his little device and a stick. Is there the capacity for a bunch of priests to go out there and sing things into place? I think so. Um, Do I think that was the, the art, priori no i actually look at it more um especially with the what i know about like the native american rain dances and the rhythmic dances that occur from the shipibos and stuff like that that i've been exposed to it always induces weather phenomenon and i've seen very very unique things occur to certain types of rock relative to the weather that the, the, the human generates. And so there's this phenomenon all throughout Central America of essentially these perfect geopolymer spheres. And there's all these bullshit explanations of what these spheres are. Oh, I've seen them. They're huge, some of them, right? Like yeah. they're, they're gigantic and they're perfectly symmetric or spherical, right? Uh, yeah. Some of them are embedded in the ground. Others are kind of like uh, on the surface. Right. Wow. So one thing I noticed, like, you know, gallivanting and all these, uh, these uh, big waterfalls that I live next to was – when you're on the bedrock of some of these waterfalls, the majority of them have these perfect cylinders that go down into them. And I would notice, and I would put my hand in there, and sometimes I get bit like by a crayfish or something. But most of the time, it was perfectly smooth, and the way the water was flowing, it wasn't like an eddy current was drilling out the rock. It was just, it was like a perfect cylinder. I've seen these at, uh, on the Susquehanna River. Michael Wan, Emily Moyer's friend, took us yeah. to a place where they have these. And then my girlfriend and I found uh, some in, at Shelburne Falls in Massachusetts. So I've seen these. Yeah. And the, the stone is incredibly hard. And you're like, water did not drill a perfectly circle hole into this. So you're, you're going to get a kick out of this. So... Uh, I was on my friend's farm and he was, he had, his farm was at about 3,500 feet of elevation, about 1,100 meters up. And he lived on this beautiful farm where the bridge of his farm was up at about 4,000 feet. And this big storm was rolling in and we were, we were hiking in the jungle and he's like, come on, I know where there's protection. So we went to this one waterfall and behind the waterfall was a cave. So, and it was just a little cave. It was enough where like two dudes could like squat down and we could watch the lightning because there was a lot of lightning. And so we get behind his waterfall and we're like laughing our asses off because, you know, we're, we're just getting pelted with rain and there's so much lightning. It was so invigorating. And then boom, this huge bolt of lightning hit right in front of the water of the waterfall. And when we looked down, the rock where it hit was one of these cylinders and it was glowing. And I was like, immediately I knew how the spheres were formed. So at least in the rainforest, I can't speak for other areas. I was talking earlier about bauxite clay. Well, bauxite clay is iron oxide. 
when you make magnets, they they use this system called radial. Uh, they call it sintering, where they send a massive amount of voltage through a piece of metal in the direction that that voltage goes through is what magnetizes all the, the metal molecules in that direction. And what makes it a magnet at that point is that all of those, you know, particles of metal are all now facing the same direction and they've been traumatized. <laughs> so they pull in one direction and push in another direction. Well, when you do that same thing to bauxite clay, what does it do? Instead of creating a rod or whatever, it creates a sphere. Whatever, whatever, like whatever box it hits, it condenses it perfectly into a plasma ball and then it hardens it into an igneous rock. And they've done this, like there's uh, ceramic companies that make these little igneous balls of ceramic by doing this. And they literally do that. They use the, the process of shocking well, the way you would make a magnet, but they do it over iron, iron oxide. And, you know, well, I should be, I should be uh, very specific with this. Um, bauxite clay is a combination of iron oxide, magnetite, and uh, aluminum silicate. So I was immediately, I was like, okay, every waterfall I've been to here has these cylinders that's obviously formed by lightning. I just watched it happen. I just watched lightning, you know, discharge. And if you've ever been close to a lightning strike, you know, some of the energy is coming up out of the ground and some of it's coming down at the same time. And they kind of meet like just above the ground. So I was like, okay, this is a highly negatively ionized space because of the waterfall that attracts the discharge between the ground current and, and the positive polarity of the sky. So now you have these cylinders that are created near these negatively ionized areas in the riverbed. Well, lightning's striking all in the forest too. So whether the, when the lightning hits the riverbed, it creates these cylinders. And when lightning hits the, the, the ground, if it doesn't hit the actual tree or something and discharges through the ground, that's how these spheres are made. So is this how they create like ball bearings in an industrial setting? Like, are they, cause like they're not shaving like these things down. Like you said with ceramics, like does this apply out into other uh, material sciences? Because I've always wondered like, how do they make these perfectly spherical marbles and ball bearings? And like, are they using electricity to do that? I don't know. I've never, I've never looked into how they make the ball that goes in a ball bearing. I yeah. should ask. There's a ball bearing company right down the road. I, I could go in there and <laughs> see if they know. Huh. But I, I was studying it because I was building clay homes. So I was looking into uh, ground discharges and stuff like that. And also in Costa Rica, because the ground is so paramagnetic, mm. uh, whenever you really need to create a ground current for your electrical system, you have to really change the soil that you put your grounding rods in. Mm. The normal paramagnetic soil doesn't discharge well. Okay. Yeah. So it, it was incredible because then I was also learning that in massage. I was like, why can't I find my grounding? Like I can't ground easily when I'm working on people's bodies. And so the earth building that I was doing was helping me ground out because I would literally – you know, at least three, four times a week have my feet, you know, moshing on earth to mix my cob, mm, you know, <laughs> right. and that, re that really helped me learn what it feels like to be grounded. Cause when your bare feet are moshing through clay and sand and, you know, natural fibers for a few hours a day, it becomes a massive contrast to when like you, your feet are insulated from the ground. Well, and, and isn't that why a lot of people have back and knee problems because we insulate our feet and then the, the static electricity like gets stored in our back and in our knees. And if you're not grounding uh, periodically, it creates issues over time. I absolutely think so. And we're always being positively ionized with the screens and the Wi-Fi and all that stuff. And so the ground is negative. The ground has a, a net negative charge. So when we walk on it barefoot, 
whatever extra charge we put in, she can handle it. She can take it and she will take it. And so I have a lot of electrosensitive friends. I have, um, I think I'm electrosensitive, but I can dissipate it by gaining weight. Like I find when I'm in an electro electro polluted area, I gain weight. Like my body adds an insulator to block it. Um, but I have lots of clients that I, 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 I've put biochar, which is like a, a very specific type of carbon in their walls to block EMF frequencies. And, um, almost all of them are ungrounded. <laughs> almost all of them don't ever really get their bare feet on the ground for more than 15 or 20 minutes a day, hmm. right. which is what you need. I would say bare minimum. Right. Yeah. I, I try to hike barefoot as much as possible. It, definitely. It's hard to do, uh, in this climate, but, uh, it's it's definitely refreshing in the winter. So you're seeing this right now? Am I sharing my screen yeah. with you? So check this out. This is a boulder we found yesterday. And uh, it's pretty large, as you can see, me standing next to it. And uh, that stone finger there is pointing due west, exactly west. And uh, like you can see, it's situated on top of another stone. And uh, from this angle, kind of looks like a duck almost. Yeah, uh, but yeah, this is this is an example of one of those so-called glacial erratics, and and it's in a place where I would imagine it'd be very hard to <laughs> just end up there of all places, and uh, and and have that weird shape too. So I don't know quite where this fits in, but it, it's interesting in connection to what we were talking about earlier, and. And then, yeah, that piezoelectric uh, force that, you know, now that we're, we're talking about magnetism and whatnot, maybe that can explain why it's uh, aligned to the West. I mean, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just one of these things that uh, hasn't been looked at by major archaeologists. Like, we have a bunch of these stone structures around New England, and they seem to be ignored by archaeologists. They're probably intentionally ignored. Right, right. I wouldn't. I wouldn't doubt that at all. <laughs> this is the the colonial. Uh, you know, this is where all the colonial prejudices were formed, right here in New England. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't even know if it's colonial. Like, uh, you know, my my family and my wife's family is from that area of the world. In fact, the last time I was in Massachusetts, my sister took me to. She's in. Marshfield, Massachusetts, which is about an hour outside of Boston. And she took me to the, the, the town that our family came over. It wasn't on the Mayflower. It was right after the Mayflower. I'm forgetting. What, Plymouth? What the, the, it, the Winthrop fleet, was it? It was like we were there like in the 1630s. Okay. <laughs> so it might have been like uh, Plymouth or, or, or uh, so, the Boston something one. Something like that. Cool. But she took me, she took us to like our great, 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 great grandfather's, you know, estate in Massachusetts. And we have like family lineage all throughout the Northeast and no North part of the United States. And now obviously it migrated South and I come from a family that were very industrious people. And I think, I, I, I don't think the history that we're given about the colonialists are, I don't think any of the history that we've been given is accurate. Mm. Um, I'm of the mind that most of it has been polluted in one way or another to disempower us. Like I really think that we come from very dignified and very intelligent and very powerful uh, beings. Like just the fact, uh, I mean, just going back 40 years, seeing my, what my dad could do with a block and tackle, like amazing, absolutely amazing stuff. I think a lot of this, the architecture, a lot of the things that have been built, it, we're just given a false narrative. So it doesn't make any sense. The truth of the matter is, 
somebody built it and whoever built it was extremely intelligent <laughs> mm, right. and, ex- and extremely skilled. And it's the framework, the context that they give us for everything is incorrect. Right. Y- you know, I, I don't believe that we're the most evolved that we've ever been right now. I don't think we're at the pinnacle of our, of evolution. I actually think we come from very evolved beings and they invert everything. Mm. Cause I see the pictures of my family from the turn of the 20th century. They all have big jaws and are beautiful and smart. Oh, I, I, they look intelligent. Like their eyes are bright, but like immaculately dressed, you know, simple for the time, like very austere, but like, Everybody, not one ounce of extra body fat on their body, just like present, like in the picture, like boom. And I'm like, those people are not lower order. I am not more advanced than they are. Just because I have like a a doohickey that's electronic (laughs) doesn't make me more advanced. Mm. Right. Like I've heard in some of your podcasts, you talk about the the gentleman, the Native American man that came back uh, to your to your area of the world to to um, Amos, Barry. Yeah. What's that? Uh, well, now you're saying Barry, so I'm not sure if you're not, going. Not Barry, the gentleman that went there for what, Geronimo. Geronimo's. Yeah, yeah, Geronimo. Amos. Yes, yes. That intelligence. That's a technology. The, the how advanced the Native Americans were, at least the ones that I choose to identify with, were with their natural systems, stunning. I've been in areas of southern India where they had, they built monuments where like their Shiva goddess would be reaching up to the sky. And at the certain times of the year, she would still be holding the Pleiades. Wow. You know, like... All, all over the world, there's like these, these less advanced heathens from the past <laughs> right. <laughs> that did absolutely amazing, amazing things. And we're just, we've been fed the materialist narrative and the way materialism, the only way materialism can work for real is through disaster capitalism. Mm. So the big bankers know that there's nothing new under the sun. They go, okay, that area is old and that area might expose some things that we don't want them to expose. Let's start a war to destroy it. We'll finance both sides and we'll cause the older economies to implode and then, or explode. And then we'll finance the newer economies. And they just play round robin right. in the realm. And it's, it's the current model of disaster capitalism doesn't lend us to an accurate way of perceiving history. Mm, absolutely. Well said, man. So I have a few more questions. I don't want to take up all your day, but, uh, but do you have some more time for a few more questions? Yeah, yeah awesome. I can talk forever. Awesome. Awesome. So you, you sent me a, you mentioned this but you sent me a couple pictures on telegram and uh i noticed at least one of them and maybe i'm wrong here but it appeared to be octagonal it was an octagonal structure mm-hmm. what yeah. what is there something unique about octagonal structures because i know that thomas jefferson was very fond of them he built these octagonal uh, mansions and what's really interesting about them is because of the eight sides, it's pretty easy to align them to other eight-sided buildings. And you can actually see that maybe there was some like very large plotting uh, across vast pieces of land where they designed this building to be perfectly you know, mm-hmm. aligned so that its edge was facing the same edge, almost like it had been placed on a grid, uh, you know, um, but what is that? Is there a reason why they would align these octagonal structures and, and, and uh, why they would want them to be eight-sided? On the very basic side of it, an eight-sided structure is considered a generator. So uh, it's if you look at it, it's actually two squares 
points that are turned at 45 degrees to each other would create an eight pointed star. And then if you connect all the edges of the star, that gives you an octagon. So there's a doubling effect to structure. So from a feng shui perspective, from a vastu perspective, from the ancient, I guess you would call occulted arts perspective, an eight-sided structure is a constructive energy. Whatever intention you have while you're building it and whatever, whatever, however you are while you're in it, it will multiply that in your environment. So that's just from the structure perspective. And then that depends on the materials that you build it with. Cause I've built metal octagonal structures and I've built wooden octagonal structures. So that is more of the male yang energy. It's projecting out. And that would be the equivalent to a spire, you know, like a, a very long cone, like let's say a cone with a 72 degree angle or more. So in the orgone world, that is, that is a projection of your intention. So octagons are very, very powerful in that way. On a, on a pure layout perspective, it's very easy to sync one octagon with another, especially if you line them to the cardinal points, the cardinal directions. Because all your cardinal directions, say north, south, east, west, they don't move on a compass, okay? And then your northwest, southwest, northeast, southeast are just 45 degrees off of that. So another way of looking at uh, uh, an octagon is you have a cube where you cut off the corners, so this is another way that you can encode the, 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 the Saturn archetype of structure where it's like there's very specific right. directions. Once again, we're in the male mind. There's very specific uh, intention. There's, we're going this direction. Yeah. And that, that's why it's seen as a, a, as a generative space to be in. I've, I've built, I naturally flow towards round structures or curved structures, vaulted structures, because instead of only having, say, you know, four directions of a cube or eight directions of an octagon, when you go in a circle, you have infinite directions. Mm. So then you have a much greater capacity to have dynamic disequilibrium, which means flow state. So I'd never answered your question earlier about a dome. The cool thing about a dome, the reason why they're so resilient is because there's no vertice inside or outside that energy can get stuck on. So what causes uh, roofs to pop in windstorms has not a lot to do with the wind getting under the roof. What is actually happening is the roof ends up acting like a wing where the surface area on the top of the roof is greater than the surface area below the roof. This creates low pressure and it pops the roof off. Go ahead. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's incredible. And to think about it like that, I've actually, uh, I've seen that happen to my tree for hurricane Sandy that, that happened to us. We had this really cute tree house it wasn't anything special but it was nice and i was looking out my back window and the tree house roof just went pop like a like someone popped a champagne bottle it was it was incredible <laughs> yeah i think it's called bernoulli's principle of the ring with a wing is when you have an airspeed that's going over the top that there's greater surface area and then you have the same airspeed going underneath you get low pressure and it creates lift mm, right and that's why whenever you look at a wing, especially jets, they're like a teardrop. Mm. They start fat in the front. And this is also a Schauberger effect. They, they stole a lot of Schauberger's ideas, which were just nature. But essentially, if you were to take a cross section of a teardrop, that's what it, like an elongated teardrop, that's what it looks like. So you get a positive ionization and a negative ionization, and you get low pressure and high pressure, and you get lift and thrust. Mm, right. Now, 
you mentioned the the octagon being like a cube with its corners cut off and uh there's a octagonal fountain in new haven and i've been looking at the the layout of new haven for a long time now just trying to contemplate why they would make the city the way it is i'm not sure if you're familiar but they created it in a nine square grid and this ended up being sort of economically not the best decision for them it it cost them a lot of money in the early days of the colony it was not an efficient layout for a city it took a lot of resources to get things from one side to another and they still have the basic layout but they've sort of cut new streets in between and in the center the square was designed so that exactly 144,000 people could stand there uh, during the end days of final judgment, right? So the, mm-hmm. the the city allegedly was built with like the Temple of Solomon in mind. And, uh, and yeah, I, I've been trying to examine like what other elements are there. Saturnian elements are present. And now that you're saying this about the eight-sided thing, it brings a, a more light to that eight-sided fountain and why it would be there but uh is there any any thought to the shape of a fountain and like how a fountain you know i mean i'm sure that has to be like a pretty uh profound aspect of architecture whenever you integrate water into a structure it's it's pretty much everything because water is the universal solvent so let's say you have like an octagonal band stand, as they called it, you know, built with marble pillars. <laughs> and then you had a fountain in front of it that was in some circular configuration that was coming out of some sort of brass or copper element that encodes Venus. You're, you're essentially... In any type of magical or spiritual rite that you would do in that space, you would supercharge it. The water, like whenever you move water, and the beautiful thing about a fountain is you're taking water under pressure and then you're releasing it. It's like it's like a rebirthing. It's like a it's like the spring of life. You know, you're you're imitating God because there's no life without water. And so it's very refreshing, especially if there's lots of beautiful elements. A lot of times in courtyards, it will cool the courtyard. Um, If you have lots of rock element around, you know, once again, you have the polarity between the positive polarity and and the negative polarity. So I'm not familiar with New Haven at all. I don't, I, I've never looked at the architecture there. But I'm pretty sure if you were to look at whatever the octagonal structure is, you could look at it from a bird's eye and you'd see the octagon. But then if you looked at the elevation of it from its profile, it probably would encode a square, a perfect cube. Mm. Because from the height relative to the, the width. Right. You right. know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And this this is this is and I'm not even saying that all the the Masons or all the people that were building it know that, but they're there. It's a way of hiding the, the cube cult. It's a way mm. of one empowering your intention, but two also giving reverence for those who have eyes to see to, to the cube. Yeah. And that's why it's really cool to have you here to, to, get your opinion and your your insight on these things cuz you have the the architectural and esoteric knowledge in that realm. Now, one other thing that I should bring up since you don't know much about New Haven is that that whole center green where the fountain was built used to be the burying ground. So there's dead bodies underneath where that fountain is. So you have not to mention that, but a stream that used to go from that area to the water. Now it's all underground. So we have this underground stream that connects to a, a separate fountain that really looks more like a drinking structure. Uh, and then this other fountain. So both of them are connected to this channel underground and there's all this, you know, uh, sleeping, resting souls, these sleeping, resting souls next to the fountain and it's being pressurized and released, right? I mean, <laughs> isn't, isn't New Haven like the insurance capital of the world? 
Hartford is, but New Haven and Hartford used to be like basically brother sister capitals of Connecticut. So I'm sure there's a little bit of bleed through. Uh, but what, yeah. what, what the internal instinctual hit that I got while mm-hmm. you were describing that was that center is used for massive magical rites. Oh, yeah. Well, the Yale University is there, Skull and oh, Bones. I didn't know that. Skull and oh, Bones. That's uh, right there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And the well, first the- cemetery in American history. Uh, this is the first type of cemetery that they created with streets and roads in between like individual plots the first one of its kind in the united states oh that's probably what's anchoring the the diamagnetic pole in in northeast then Mm. that because so when you ever you have running water you have a current and if they put it over a burial ground where they actually had like you know chiefs and 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 men of renown um, there would be the ka, their ka, their essence would be, I won't say enslaved, but their ka would be used for their intention. Right. Well, it, that's, that's why they do that on these, on these mound structures is like, they'll, they'll overtake these mounds because they know that the ka, the life, the life energy that the, that was physically embodied they they can harness it with with the frozen music of architecture wow yeah they, man. They, and then they'll divert and route waterways because you could look at all these waterways as being the veins and arteries of this plane of existence so it's just like setting up a pump station for your intention Right. Where it's always being fueled with the energy of the earth where she's sending her water in. And then you have the energy of these men and women of renown. And then that's all being structured by the structure you put on top of it. Yeah. Damn. That's why they always build cities on top of other cities. Yeah. Because these cities are on top of massive power points. Right. So it makes no sense just to go to some area that doesn't have, you know, ley lines or dragon paths. Why don't we go and build on top of structures that we know have already been cultivated for structures and more than likely the history had it because these were power points. Mm, These were nexus points. Right. And that's leading me to what I was going to ask you uh, finally about, uh, pendulums and, and water divining rods and this whole mm-hmm. science of, of divination, uh, finding out where water is underground. You know, it's it's something that kind of borders on the realms of like magic, but also like practical science because like my father, for example, works for the water department and that's one of their techniques that they use. They have these you know, weather witching rods. And I remember he showed me when I was a kid and I was so perplexed by this, like, cause my, here's my dad, this like mechanical practical guy who doesn't like go to church, doesn't really talk about stuff like that. And he's showing me like these energy devices. And I'm like, is this supposed to be magic? Are you showing me magic? Like, what? you know, there's like sort of a, a disconnect there, but how regular it, regularly do you use those uh, energy devices in architecture? Every time I build. Wow. Yeah, I just did a site survey where I used them. So the only reason why it seems like alien or witchy is because we're not taught about our own biology. Your right hand is positive. Your left hand is negative. You hold copper rods. You're creating a horseshoe circuit. Okay. The copper rods usually are, is they have a vertical plane, a vertical axis, and a horizontal axis. In geometry, that's what you use to locate things. <laughs> copper is conductive. Copper also encodes five. Phi, which encodes water. Copper rules water. That's why having water go through copper pipes is very, very good. It Like if you ever had farm implements and you wanted to be like a biodynamic farmer, you'd make all your farming implements out of copper 
even though it's a soft metal, it doesn't matter. It actually is more healthy for the ground. You'd get a much greater yield with what you're doing just because the copper isn't steel. It's not an amalgam that's cutting and hurting the ground. Mm. The copper actually would induce collagens, add quality to whatever you're sticking it into. And it's because of the water element, which is Venus. <laughs> so this is, gets very alchemical and all this stuff. So here you're holding these divining rods. The divining rods are using your body positive. Well, we're opposite here. So right hand positive, left hand negative. And I use this in massage with polarity therapy. Right hand's positive, left hand's negative. Thumbs are neutral, positive, negative, positive, negative. So the way the copper naturally lies in your hand, you're not gripping it hard. You're just gripping it naturally. The copper, the vertical axis, tunes to the ground. The horizontal axis tunes to your body in relation to the ground. Well, guess what? You're like 99% water. Holding conductive metal that's water, and you're the body electric when you're walking on the ground. So all you do is sub, it's not even subconsciously, you just ask, which is stating your intention, which we've been talking about architecture, which is just frozen intention. You're stating your intention, please show me the water on this property. And man, it, it will show you. It'll come and it'll go ding, 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 ding. And then, like, if you come across a dragon path, they'll start to spin counterclockwise. Like, there's all these, like, and it's, it's, it's not witchcraft. It's the way we were built. We were built to interact with this environment. We were given domain over it. But it's not the domain that, you know, the, the elitist empire mind talks about, it's more like the domain of the, the native American that could find shelter and call in the meat when they needed it and hunt it correctly. And all these types of things, we have this natural symbiotic relationship with the forest and with the rivers and with the trees that we just have to remember it's already programmed into us and the divining rods are perfect for that. That's like just the basis. Cause you could even like ask how deep is this water? And like you bring the, the rods down to your, down to your waist and like the rods will want to tip. And so you walk away and the distance that you walk away from that and they re elevate that distance horizontally is the distance vertically that the water is down. Wow. It's so accurate. <laughs> In Costa Rica, we had to use them. The, the gentleman that showed it to me, he saved his clients millions of dollars from telling them, no, they can't build there. They really wanted to build one spot. And he's like, don't no, I won't build there. If you want me to, I'm, I'm going to, I, I refuse to, there's water running under there. Mm. And in that environment, it's tough because the water is always changing, you know, cause it's, it, the, all of the Southern zone of Costa Rica is essentially a slip spring mm. up here where you're in more limestone rich areas. You get much more aquifer springs. What's, what's known as a, a artesian spring. The slip springs are, are tricky because that's just when water is going downhill, it hits bedrock and it needs to find a way out. That's not from a, from an artesian source. Right. So yeah, it's awesome. I, I love all this stuff. Yeah, dude. Topher, this has been really, really impressive. Really tapped me into to the excitement of what, is in front of me because here in new england as i've said a, a bunch of times there's so many things that i'm i'm like seeing with new eyes mm -hmm. and all of what we've talked about today is like upgrade 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 i'm like getting these little upgrades now i can go and re-examine uh, and i'm really excited now 
I'm going to send you some pictures uh, on Telegram as I get them, but I'm really excited to show you some of these uh, stone structures to get your opinion on on what could Please be do. going on there. And and yeah, I would recommend to you and anyone listening a book called Seed of Knowledge, Stone of Plenty, and that's where they sort of pose this theory that there's something going on with the electromagnetic nature of these stone structures that helps uh, with farming and... Uh, yeah, enough about all that. Where can folks go to see some of the work you've done and maybe learn a little bit more about what we've talked about today? Do you have a website or a place that folks can see pictures and builds and maybe even uh, hire you if they're interested? Yeah, uh, I'm launching TopherHQ.com. <laughs> so it's uh, I've done, I don't even know how many podcasts and interviews with people over the years. So that would be sort of a clearinghouse for that. I'm going to be doing like a little science podcast where I'm going into cosmology with uh, people that I really respect. And uh, I used to have a podcast in 2014 and 2015. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I just did it because I really respected a lot of minds and it was a way that I could learn. And so um, it's kind of fun because a lot of those people have gotten you know, pretty, pretty decent followings over the years. So I'm going to get to rehash those connections because I've remained friends with all of them. And uh, we're all in, in a different station of life now. And uh, I guess a lot, there's going to be a documentary that's going to be um, being made about some of the structures I'm building in Missouri. And that's going to be on Bertaria Times. Well, what is that? I don't know the name of the website, but all that will be accessible from my, from my, um, from my topherhq.com website. And, uh, yeah, then on that people can contact me. I do celestic profiling for people. Mm. I do architecture design for people. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I, I have to provide at the moment. Right on. So the, the celestic profiling, would you, does that include the astrocartography uh, put stuff at all? No? No. No. I, I'm in a pretty interesting position because I can never look at something and just do it the way anyone else does it. <laughs> mm. all, all my years of uh, studying astrology, I've gotten to the point of, I think I figured out the original astrology before it was perverted. Okay. And it's very simple. And it, studying the law, because I'm studying the law right now, it's kind of brought me to this. It, it, it gave me hints. So in the law, like say, you, say somebody makes a claim against you and you go to court and you're standing in, for, in front of the judge. If the judge or the bailiff asks you your birthday and you agree that that's your birthday, you are now in a lower jurisdiction. You're in the jurisdiction below the judge. But as a living man, if they ask you your birthday and you deny it, that's you're now signaling the court, which is the crown that you're not, you're a man in good standing because your birth date isn't your your actual day of uh, vivality, the day that you became in vivo. The only way in, I shouldn't call it the only way, that's incorrect. You can signal those that want to have agency over you that you're, you're in a higher jurisdiction than them by not allowing them to put their stipulations on you. Mm. So when you use your birthday, that's signaling to them that you see yourself as a slave. Even if you don't know that's what it is, that's what it is. Because they've been training people for the last hundred years to identify with their birth date. The truth of the matter is you came alive upon conception. And in law, a living man has the highest jurisdiction. So if you claim to be of your birth date, you're, at, you're considered dead. 
you're considered a corporeal entity. Right. If you don't, if you say, no, that, that isn't my in vivo day, they can't hold, they can't hold claim over you because you're not corporeal. And there's all, there's a million ways to skin a cat. I was just saying that that fact was one of the hundreds of facts that brought me into doing conception astrology where on your birthday, you look 40 weeks prior. And I studied that for a few years and I do real sky astrology. I don't use ephemeri that are, use averages. So that means like I can look at the sky and understand what's there and get like, okay, I know that's Neptune and the moon and they're in the constellation Pisces. Like I, I can tell that from the sky. Like <laughs> that was what was going on for my daughter on, on her, on her date of birth. And in conception astrology, you look, you look at what the template was that you came in with when you were conceived. And that gives a very specific profile that gives a much more accurate profile than let's just say your natal chart. Cause your natal chart is more describing what I would call your persona. It does have relevance to you, but it's more, it's the superficial aspect of you that the world interacts with. Mm. Whereas your celestic profile, I call it celestic profile because celestic means you're, you're actually looking at real sky observances. And, um, and then the profile is just like, this is God's template for you. This is the core of why your Dharma, why you are here. And I had a hunch for this for about the last eight years since I've been studying the law. And then it got confirmed by another astrologer because I brought it up to her. It's actually uh, Chance's court astrologer, Kaylee. I actually, I, I've been having ongoing conversations with her and I was like, Kaylee, what do you think about my idea? And after like a month or two of, of researching it, she came back to me with this whole like 12 page treatise from the Rosicrucians. And this is exactly how the Rosicrucians would, would calculate somebody's chart. And once wow. you start to get into the history of the Rosicrucians, you're like, okay, these people know a lot <laughs> and they know a lot that they don't, they, that they do not share. It's so funny that we got here because my research has brought me to learn that Yale was founded by members of the Royal Society and funded by members of the Royal Society and then inhabited by members of the Royal Society for a while. So, wow, that's incredible. I, and the Rosicrucians, I should say, uh, created like the idea that became the Royal Society. So there's sort right. of a connection there. But uh, But wow, that's incredible. So... You got me hooked. I'm interested. I want to get a session. I want to learn, you know, what is my dharma? Because I, I feel like I've, I've understood my persona through astrology pretty well. But I've never had that moment of like, yeah, this is me from astrology, you know. Uh, and you're coming into that perfect time of your Saturn return. Because from, from the standpoint of your conception, you are in your Saturn return. Right, right. Wow. Got to put it back 40, 40 weeks, reverse it. Yeah. Very yeah. Cool. And th that's when the spark of life of you, boom, created. Yeah. The, the body is just manifested the spirit. Your right. spirit was, ta-da. So, yeah, that, that sonoluminescent spark of Mark went boop. And there was a signature in the sky because I looked at the sky is just an extension of our greater body mm. and our spine is our axis mundi so getting back to the rosicrucians and when you look at their cross and how their crosses encodes the vesica pisces which encodes you know the age of pisces and christ and all these other things all this comes down to 
like actually accessing that Christ within like the, 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 the pure divine being that has, but the faith of a mustard seed could move a mountain. Mm. And the reason why they don't let that information out is because it's powerful. And like Rockefeller said, you know, competition should be illegal. (laughs) Yeah. Right. They, they just don't want competition. It's, Mm. it's that simple. They just don't want the competition. So they hide all the truths behind the megalithic sites. They hide all the glory of our ancestry. They hide all of this because if we were coming from that mindset and not the stoned ape theory, we would be empowered to take our shit back. (laughs) Exactly. Yes. And this is why my family thinks I'm crazy because I want to compete. I don't want to just go along to get along. I want to compete with Mr. Rockefeller. I want to show them what's what's good <laughs> yeah and you're doing a great job man you you put out an awesome product i'm Thank very you. impressed with what you do so I, i'm i'm very pleased to be on your on your show Dude, Topher, thank you. And this has been, I mean, longer than most episodes go. So for your sake, you're you're definitely a a compelling guest. And I want to invite you to come back on again for a a continuation of this conversation. There's a few notes that I took that I I didn't get a chance to follow back yet. So let's let's schedule something for the near future. But uh, yeah. Everything you just mentioned, links and whatnot, will be in the description. So, folks, please go support Topher. Check out what he's got going on. Get yourself a, a reading. Understand your, uh, remind me again the proper name of this. You called it a... Celestic Profiling. A Celestic Profiling. Perfect. So, until next time, folks, immerse yourself in the moment, wherever you are, in the now. little extra terrestrial trying to stay human in a cesspool of professionals but i confess too much off of the tongue all my aunties and my uncles shield the ears of the young i be saying shit and they don't know where it's coming from in like a hundred years we went saw a bomb with free guns check the facts check the fed check the stars stanley mines was murked for a water fuel cell car they each they own you can stick with your old ways but eat the rich and drink the motherfucking kool-aid and i can see the red on your lip stain white skin blue collar pure american made fuck it you can keep your blood so heritage And run the soul off the moon landed narrative Yeah, my girl thinks that I'm embarrassing My folks think I'm nuts but never question the parenting Stuck in bed so my boss thinks I'm lazy Connecting dots but it's all kinda hazy The morning in the net feeling like I'm Dick Tracy My pap thinks I'm un-American and shady Yeah, I'm feeling unhinged lately Encounters of the fifth kind on the daily You could tell me that the president's an alien It wouldn't phase me my family thinks I'm crazy Baby, baby, baby My family thinks I'm crazy Baby, baby, baby You might think that I'm off in the deep end One too many Netflix docs on the weekends But check the budget for a military defense Tell me we ain't scared of something not within reason Steel beams, another 1492 and 9-11 was the red, white, and blue And you be lit off the floor, I ain't got a clue All your dreams just shit on a Rockefeller shoes Don't believe a damn thing a politician ever said Ain't one brick left to gold up in the Fed They still got bricks of cocaine to make crap Oxy's killing the working class, FDA's whack Talking like this, got kin talking behind backs Too much to unpack, so they talk smack And I'm just trying to converse with my clan, but it ain't fan So I'm here setting up can Stuck in bed, so my boss thinks I'm lazy Connecting dots, but it's all kinda hazy I'm on the internet, feeling like I'm Dick Tracy My pack thinks I'm un-American and shady Yeah, I'm feeling unhinged lately Encounters of the fifth kind on the daily You could tell me that the president's an alien It wouldn't phase me my family did some crazy Baby, baby, baby My family thinks I'm crazy Maybe, maybe, maybe Just maybe Stuck in bed so my boss thinks I'm lazy Connecting dots but it's all kind of hazy I'm on the internet feeling like I'm Dick Tracy My pap thinks I'm on the marriage and it's shady 
I'm feeling unhinged lately The counters of the fifth kind on the table You can tell me that the president's an atheist You wouldn't phase me My family thinks I'm crazy Anything out, so 